So I think it's uh, 15 past the hour and that's the time to start. I was just thinking early on, I've got my IATI tag mug here <laughs> from, from Tanzania, but unfortunately it's broken. Uh, the water comes out. So that's a shame. And it's a real shame not to see people uh, and, and just see this, but hopefully we'll meet, we'll meet soon sometime. Um, so I'm going to start, uh, I'm going to talk for the next uh, next period of time about uh, the, the COVID IATI data and, that we've worked with. Uh, we're the Centre for Humanitarian Data. Uh, you may have heard of the work that we do also around COVID, but many other things that have to do with humanitarian data uh, and humanitarian data needs. Uh, my name is Stephen Flower. Um, I've been involved in IATI for 10, 10 years now, 10 years. So um, it's, it's great to be here and, and talk with people virtually, but uh, the best IRT events are always face-to-face. -face. Um, okay, so hopefully everyone is in the room, <laughs> 45 people, I think, um, and on we go. So um, the outline for today, um, I'm gonna get through quite a bit. Uh, I'm gonna talk about, first of all, what have we done by this project? Uh, then I'm gonna talk a little bit about our team, and I think there's a really interesting story there about our team. Uh, then I want to get quickly into issues we found with IATI data, uh, and I really want to spend some time on that. Then looking at things that users told us, and then we, we really want to move this on to what are the, what are the higher level findings and recommendations that we have as a team for IATI publishers and the IATI standard. Um, so there won't be so much today of, of demonstrating the tool and the things because we think it's really important to get into some of the issues some of them are very specific, others are, are much wide ranging. And I think there'll be plenty of time for, um, for discussion as well. So hopefully with uh, my colleagues, Nick and Julia, will put their, uh, people will put their hand up. I think we'll collect questions and we'll, we'll get to those towards the end. Uh, first. So before I start, I want to uh, invite Ashley Bakuzi from USAID to say, say a few words. They're a project sponsor for this, for this work. Mm -hmm. And hopefully somebody can bring Ashley in <laughs> and we can hear from, from USAID. Well, you have me, Stephen. I'm here. Hello, everyone. Excellent. It's so nice to be here. Um, thank you so much. Um, so I'm Ashley Bakutsi. I support donor coordination for USAID's COVID-19 response um, globally. And it is such a privilege to be here. We are so grateful to our OCHA colleagues. We're in admiration um, of our OCHA colleagues for the presentations and insights. And so far be it from me to take up much of the time, but I was so tempted to offer a word on how much this work has meant to us at USAID over the past few months. Um, so just a personal account. So I joined USAID last year. And of course, at that time, we knew so little about how much we would be relying on tracking aid data for the COVID pandemic and how much we'd need those real-time data updates to be continuing, obviously, to present day, as I'm sure we're all facing. At the time that I joined USA, just to make all who are um, in this VCE smile a little bit, I hope, we were manually tracking um, all donor commitments through, I wanna say more than 30 separate websites, news sites, press releases, whatever we could find, manually keying in uh, numbers on what the news source said a certain donor was sending to a certain country or region or organization, et cetera. And we did this every month for longer than we should admit. So when we started working with the OCHA team, we saw this very exciting real world example on how we could use IATI data to be um, so much more efficient in our tracking, um, save ourselves the time, but also help to socialize the value of what IATI can capture and does capture. Um, and so the COVID funding dashboard that we'll see today tells us a, a as I would say, a yet untold story on pandemic spending that many other sites have uh, captured in pieces, but none like this dashboard. Um, and our, our OCHA team knows I really could go on for days about how helpful it's been to us and again, how much it saved us time. Um, but since that is not the purpose of this presentation, I'll just say we are using in USAID, the dashboard now underpins 
our internal situations and situational dashboard, our situational analytical tools on COVID-19 response to compare how global spend data um, in certain regions and contexts um, trends against um, the, the pandemic uh, writ large, virus trends, vaccination trends, et cetera, other impact areas. So this is a huge uh, asset to us in our own ability to think an analytically, and hopefully that's the same for others. Um, as aid practitioners and as advocates at USAID for strong aid data transparency, we're, we're so significantly invested at this look in the mirror, as I'm stealing from Stephen already into the presentation, um, and the spirit for ourselves and for all of our peers of continuous improvement. We shudder to think, though I think we've all been wondering the same, how much the insights we glean here will be helpful and relevant in future crises. Um, it's hard to consider that the pandemic has been of such, an, of such a massive scale, one that I know we've all said have more than any in our lifetime have faced. And hopefully we would never need to work at such a scale. But because of the lack of coordination, there will maybe that's what I, I might sound like that in French. I, um, my apologies. Um, but we know that there is likely a chance that being able to extrapolate on issue areas or other crisis areas will help us so much. Um, and so it'd be great to consider this world where we're all held accountable to the data stories that we see here, helping us to make those important and difficult decisions and much more, much more, um, efficiently and effectively than the ear to the ground manual mining. That is where we came from last year. So it's been such a pleasure for us to work with this team. They've brought to USAID and our aid partners so much um, intense illumination, sharp and nuanced insights that I am now officially keeping you from. And so as we dive into the presentation, uh, just would urge you to please consider what the IATI community can learn from this experience and how we can walk away together as change agents for uh, the COVID pandemic response, the decisions that still need to be made, and then of course, thinking about what is yet to face our world. And so thank you, without further ado, back to you, Stephen. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ashley. Thank you for the, for the words and the context, I think is really, really helpful. I apologize, I shared my screen whilst you were talking, but I'll try that again. But thanks very much, Ashley. Okay, so back to, to where we are. Um, so first of all, um, I want to give you an overview of the project and specifically really the things that we, we delivered and have with the project. Um, so that's, first of all, you may, uh, may have seen, but you'll have plenty of chance to see uh, after, this, after this, um, this, uh, this, uh, this short event, uh, the IATI COVID-19 funding dashboard. So the funding dashboard uh, takes the IATI data that's published that uses the COVID-19 guidance and it provides real insights and headlines at a glance, at a glance figures in terms of how much money has been committed to COVID and how much money has been spent. Alongside that, it also gives an overview of the flows of money between organizations and some indication of the timeline of those commitments and spending as well. So we spent a lot of time with the, with the, dash, the funding dashboard to get it into the shape where it is. It updates every day and it reads only IATI data into it. So it's all about IATI data, but as we'll talk about later on, we try not to say IATI too much in, in amongst it. We, we tried really hard to make it uh, of use to, to, to non-IATI people as well. So that's the COVID, uh, IATI COVID-19 funding dashboard, um, and there's plenty to see and do with that. Alongside the dashboard, we also produced uh, what we call a data story so when we talk to people uh, about IATI data and the, the dashboard, we, we also thought we needed to produce something that would give a story, give some insights into the data with some, some graphs, some text uh, available. And that might be something that's a bit more accessible to people uh, than just going to a dashboard straight away. So we really like the story, the data story. It talks about the real growth in IATI uh, publishing using the COVID-19 uh, guidance. And then we take some, some specific looks at insights between certain sectors, the timeline of uh, commitments. And in the bottom right here is, is a really interesting graph where we look at the gap between the commitments and spending in certain countries. Um, 
The COVID-19 uh, data story is fixed in terms of a data that we had in September, whereas the dashboard updates every night. Uh, we didn't want to make the dashboard become dynamic because it would become out of date, but it's a really nice piece for people to share as we've found. As Ashley mentioned, a real thing, and this is the only cat picture I have, I'm afraid, uh, the, the, uh, the, the, the real thing that we were interested in here um, was to produce dashboards and data stories, but hold a mirror up to IIT data. So that became really important for organizations that are publishing IIT data to see how their data looks, but also see how that looks with others as well. Uh, and also we, we found holding that mirror up becomes really helpful to see how you could change your data or how your data compares to others. Um, so it's really key for us not to edit or correct or, or, or change IATI data overly, but to try and, try and use it as quickly and as wholesale as we can and hold that mirror up. Um, and that, that, that became a, a thing we would always discuss on, on our team, team calls and such. So holding the mirror up to IATI data. Okay, moving on from the cat. We do have, um, uh, quite a quite a in-depth methodology uh, in terms of how we use IATI data here. As I said earlier on, we only use IATI data for the, for this project. We extract the data every night from dPortal. We run that through various processes and algorithms to get summary data that we can then load into the into the dashboard, for example, every night. So this methodology is very well documented. I know lots of people in the community have. Uh, discussed this. We've discussed it on, for example, the data use working group calls and elsewhere. And we think the methodology is, is something to share and something for others to reuse, particularly about how we use IATI data uh, to, to make these summaries and to make these, uh, these visualizations. So the methodology was really a key part underpinning the, the dashboard and the data story. Um, but the methodology came from our team, our team working with USAID ID and, and others in the community that we talked to. And I just wanted to reflect short, very, very briefly on, on our team, because I think it's really, really interesting. You can see here, uh, there were a number of people involved in this project. I am the IATI specialist I, I, because I've been around for many years, I think. Um, we had a data scientist, Manu, uh, Mike, getting data, moving data from it, between systems. David Meganson, I'm sure colleagues know, uh, he, he's, he's an expert in IATI and other standards. Erica made things at the front end that we interact with, at, at, at the front end and back end, I should say. Uh, Erica did a lot more, more to the front end. Yumi added lots of design experience. Kareem helped us through this and Sarah was our lead at the center. So there's lots of people involved in this project, which I thought was really interesting. Um, and sometimes IATI projects can be very, very isolated, isolating and very singular. So it's great to work with a wider team. But I also reflected on how much experience between us or each person had of IATI. And I mentioned the 10 years I've been around. David's been around even longer with IATI, uh, uh, having been involved in the first version. But most of those people I mentioned before have zero years experience or very, very few experience, particularly hands on experience of IATI. And that was that was really vital and interesting because not only did we have to use IATI data, we had to talk to each other and explain lots and lots IATI to our colleagues. You know, we'd have lots of conversations about what is a commitment, why is a commitment outgoing and ingoing, incoming, et cetera, et cetera. So it's really vital that we, we our colleagues could understand IATI but more about how could we make sense of things with IIT data together and then, and then with others. So hopefully, hopefully we, we should see more of these projects uh, over the years of, um, of, of people coming into IIT and, we'll, and working with others to, to make things happen. So without getting uh, side, side, without getting into, into the, the, the tool and the, the dashboard, I wanted to sort of focus in first of all on the top five things that we encountered and David and I and Sarah and others when we were writing the report and such things really wanted to, to focus in on the on five things that we found as we used IATI data, COVID IATI, IATI data about COVID-19 every, every day uh, the past few months. So these are the top five things that I think people can have got opinions on and we should discuss. But first of all, we found uh, when we used IATI data, there were lots of what we called false positives. In other words, we would find 
IATI activities that maybe had the term COVID-19 in them, but they weren't really about COVID-19. Um, what we found with the, with the IATI COVID-19 uh, COVID IATI guidance, that came out really quickly. That was really welcome, uh, very helpful. Lots of organizations use that guidance to publish data. When we started to look at the data, we found lots of organizations maybe just use the description text or the title to say COVID-19. Now, in many cases, that was quite logical. This project is about COVID-19, for example. But in other cases, we would find in description text, this project has changed because of COVID-19, or this project is no longer happening because of COVID-19, for example, or, or, or variations of. So we had to be really careful if we're using IATI data every, every day and every night, we're trying to use uh, algorithms and machines to do that. We could falsely assume that some data is about COVID-19 when in actual fact it wasn't. And a lot of that was to do with description, description text uh, in activities. So the false positives were, were, I think, welcome. It was a good challenge. We really looked into it. But we should be careful going forward about how we, how we give guidance about, about these things, particularly in dense description text. So that was the first issue. Um, the second uh, thing that we found um, when, we, when we used IATI data every, every day, uh, we really wanted to, to, to build this, these models of this is how much money has been committed, this is how much money has been spent. And we had um, quite interesting ways to calculate the, these, these values, uh, but they relied on organizations publishing data fairly consistently particularly with, with commitments, uh, whether they be incoming or outgoing commitment transactions. And what we found sometimes in some organizations, the co commitment transactions were, were either missing or they, they were meant to be outgoing, but they were incoming or incoming or outgoing. So um, what, the, what that meant was that even though we, we thought we could rely on all the IATI data to be fairly consistent, the inconsistency of commitments meant that we, we may have, that some data looked quite skewed or quite, quite not how it should be. And here's an example of uh, one organization that has spent, for example, 1.2 billion on COVID, but made no commitment or have no commitment around that. And we thought that was, that was quite quizzical. We thought we looked at that quite quizzically uh, in terms of, is that right? Should we expect commitments? And we'd, and we'd really welcome thoughts in the community about consistency of uh, commitment transactions. So that was our second uh, challenge issue. Third one, uh, the third one would be around the, the depth, the, uh, the, the, the amount of data that we would find when an, org when an organization had created an IATI activity that would have, for example, three countries and four sectors. Uh, and often when this, this type of data was held at the activity level rather than at the transaction level. What we, would, what, we, what we would do with the project, we would split up all the transactions that were published into the various uh, pieces that were given in the, in the activity. So here we've got health at 45%, basic nutrition 31%, et cetera, et cetera. And we'd have to split up every transaction accordingly uh, but equally, when, they, when there were more than one country, in this case there were three, we'd have to split them up even more. And we thought sometimes that starts to look a bit strange. It starts to look a bit strange when you've got uh, a very small segment of a transaction in Canada in basic nutrition, for example, with this example here. Uh, and, and that led us to think sometimes it might not be useful to have these activities where there are lots of countries or and lots of sectors at the, at the activity level. It could be a lot more practical to have this data at the transaction level or split up those activities into smaller units. And we found that was a real challenge to help us be confident about the data when, when we would be um, splitting, splitting it up and splitting it up again, as you can see. So that, that presented another challenge, splitting up, processing these large activities. Two more coming up, two more challenges. I'm just going to have a drink of water. Um, a lack of precision excuse me, um, a lack of precision was our, was our fourth challenge. And what, what, what we mean, what we found was interesting and useful uh, here is that um, as we're discussing on IATI Connect at the moment, the COVID-19 sector code has been, has been made available. It came through the OECD DAC um, channels and it's been available. Um, but we found sometimes that 
that sector code was used as a flag and it could replace more granular sectors. So if, a pro if an activity were about education, suddenly it's all about COVID. Um, so this lack of precision uh, meant it was difficult to see within this, well, where's the trends on vaccination, for example, or where's the trends in other elements of COVID. As we all know, COVID um, has, taken over, has taken and influenced and uh, negatively influenced many parts of our, uh, of our society. So having one sector code just for COVID seemed a bit, um, a bit unhelpful for us in, in trying to understand deeper trends. And we also found there's a lack of precision for some organizations who want to be very clear at, tra at the transaction level, what this transaction was for. Uh, the nature of the ATI standard meant it wasn't quite practical to do so. And, and we do say that in the, in the reports as well. But yeah, that lack of precision for some and lack of precision of wider sector codes did present challenges. Um, the fifth and final uh, uh, challenge that we found uh, in using IAT data every day uh, that was about COVID-19 is perhaps not, uh, not a new one, but uh, this, this real lack of um, organisational uh, consistency describing organisations in IAT data. So we would find very little use of the, the known references that we have for organisations, whether they, you know, particularly IAT publishers or multilaterals or donors, we wouldn't find real consistent use of that. Um, we would also find organizations described in words, letters, in different ways. And this just made it really difficult for us to try and give a, a, a wider picture of where, where money is flowing between organizations. Because remember the mirror, the mirror thing that I showed you earlier on, um, the cat, the mirror, uh, for us to really give you give a, a flow diagram of, of uh, you know, a definitive flow diagram, we'd have to start editing data every day and, and that's just not sustainable. So we were really challenged again by the lack of consistency between, between data sets in terms of how, how they describe themselves, uh, the other organizations. Um, and it, was, it was a real, real issue. So those are the five things that we found uh, using our IT data every day with our team, with our process. Uh, we did talk to to, to people quite quite a lot uh, to begin at the beginning of the project and towards the end of the project certainly um, and I wanted to share just three things about about this and I like uh, my colleague Sarah uh, made this term making sense without with IATI I think is really helpful rather than making sense of IATI so making sense with IATI um, what we found is that people actually do want at a, we called it at a glance at a glance um, uh, visualizations, being able to see wider trends, wider wider things using IAT data than, than we typically may have done elsewhere. So that, that was a real key demand. People wanted to not just simplify uh, IAT because it was too complicated, but really see things that, that they couldn't, that, that would take a lot of time to process themselves. So this at a glance IAT, is, there seems to be a real key demand for that. Um, and it does involve us also for example, rolling up um, countries, so regions uh, and sector codes, for example, when we need to. But this, this, this um, demand is there. People want to see, we think, IATI data in, in an at-a-glance format. The second thing that we found really uh, interesting that people really valued is trends. Um, and if you do work with IATI data, you know there's lots of dates in IATI data, transaction date, activity date, value dates, all these dates. Um, and that made it quite straightforward for us to give these trend diagrams of uh, spending commitments, for example. And again, we think that we think that's really uh, a real value that people have when they use IT data to see trends over time. Particularly, uh, as we know, that the, the, the pandemic had a, had, has got a, a, a time frame in a sense, and we, it's interesting to see data over time there. Uh, and we know, for example, in Dportal, there are there are nice graphs and such there, but the trends here that are wider than just activity level seem seem very engaging to people. And the final uh, thing I mentioned this one earlier on, uh, this this comparison between things seems to be very engaging to people. Compa comparing commitments and spending by country, for example, uh, it, it's precisely in this this graph that's in the the data story, people were very engaged with this, very interested in this. 
And we have to also remember that this behind this is all the IATI data that we're using and the processes and the algorithms that we have. But if people, people want to be engaged with IATI data, it seems these are the things that they're, they're these are some of the things that they're asking for. And we can't just uh, use an excuse of data quality to, to say that's not possible. It is possible and, and people, people appreciated it with the, with the, the nuances. Okay, um, so those are the things that people told us. Those are the issues I had told you before. Uh, now nearly there, uh, we were keen today to share with you some higher level observations. Just be thinking, we, you know, we can, I, I can talk about commitments, data and, and organization references all week, but I think it'd be really good to like try and move it up a level to higher level things that we could all, all talk about the next couple of days. So uh, we've, a, a short thing, three things uh, at higher level, sorry. The first one, we think there's, there is a, a, there are real barriers to data use. Um, as a team, we spend a lot of time and effort doing really basic things with the data, both explaining IATI and explaining transactions, but also converting uh, currencies, uh, spotting for errors and such things. Um, so we know there are tools around, we know validators exist, this is really, really helpful, but data seems to be consistently inconsistent. and. The standard, as a colleague said in the, in the plenary, is quite complicated. All those things together is just, a, we should remember it, there's a real barrier to using the data, uh, we think. And, and that was evident in, in, the, in the beginning of our project. It was quite, quite, a, quite a thing to get, to, get, to get going. So there's a barrier to data use. We think that there are a few feedback loops um, in IATI at the moment. So all this, all this report and all the things I'm, I've shared with you so far, uh, it's not quite clear where we take these recommendations. Um, I could say I know where to do that, but, my, but the team who are not familiar with IATI, they're not quite clear what to do and where to go forward. Um, so we really do want to help with the things that we found and the, thing, and the processes and algorithms that we've written, but it's not quite clear both how to engage with the standard and to engage with publishers. Um, so the, the feedback loops around IATI, there seem to be few and far between, and, and we think that's a, that's a thing to address and discuss. Thirdly, finally, the, the, the higher level insight, um, there are no, so not no, there are very few collective insights around IATI. So we found that organizations using the dashboard would generally always go and look at their own data. Quite rightly, you want to see what your data looks like, understand. But there's a, real there's a real theme, we think, around the focus of IATI and compliance and individual organizations. Whereas what we really do need to think about, in our opinion, is we need to think about how our data works together. How do we get to that network of data that's talked about in the IATI strategy? How, how do we really understand what we can gain from a, a wider data set than just our own data sets on their own? And we think that's a real barrier, a real blocker going forward. We need to, we need to understand what we've got in common with the data, not just what, what our data does individually. So those are the three higher level insights we wanted to, to give and, and share today. And they're in the report that we published this morning as well. Um, and the, the report uh, gives a, a, a few recommendations. Uh, the recommendations at the publishing and the standard level, uh, using transaction level sectors and countries more, Let's use transactions more consistently. I talked about that one. Identify partners more, more, more widely and consistently. We could use met extensions to this schema and, and to, to explore the, some of these things and avoid, avoid this notion of free text as markers you know, in, the te in the description. So a lot of what I've talked about, we, we detail in the report how, how we should go about that and what, what the next steps might be. So that's recommendations we have for the IATI community, publishers and users to, to take things forward. And the second set of recommendations are more strategic um, uh, and, and talk to those higher level, higher level um, issues we, we, highlight, we highlighted. Um, and those are, let, let's think about IATI governance involving data users. Let's, let's understand how we can govern the standard by, by talking very specifically with those that use the data or face barriers to use. And we know things like that are happening, but um, It'd be great to see more of. We think as well, um, guidance could, should involve best practice. Uh, we saw lots of really good practice for publishing IIT data, and it'd be great to highlight that and include that in guidance, uh, rather than just be descriptive about how things should, how things do work. So let's use the good practice we see and, 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 and share that more widely. 
And the third point is this, this challenging point, I think, about uh, let's, we've got to focus on the collective story of IATI, not just that of individual publishers. And um, whilst it's great and, and right that we, we understand how the, the quality of each publication, we need to understand the quality of the, the whole of, of IATI data or, or, or good parts of it at least. So those strategic recommendations are also in the report as well. Um, and, and really just to end on a, on a bit more of a positive note that I think, but, but yeah, I think it's okay. Um, we think that the, the, in the report, we say that the, the potential of the of IATI is, is just be, begun to be tapped. You know, there's really great things with IATI data. And we, we've shown what we, what we think we could do with, with this small set of IATI data. So there's, there's, there's wonderful opportunities with the data. Um, but we've got to make some improvements to the standard, the guidance and governance to, to really get to that goal, that goal that we really cherish and share. Okay, that's good. We've got, we got some time and um, thank you everybody for listening. I, I'm aware there's some, some questions in the box. I, I, I was petrified of going into breakout rooms or anything like that. So we're staying here and we're gonna talk about this for the, for the next few minutes. I don't know if Nick or Julia or anybody can help me with questions and such, but uh, let's see see where we go. Yeah, any I questions just summarize the questions and sent them directly to you. Um, I can also read them to you if that would be more useful. Okay, I've got some here. Thank you, Nick. Um, okay, so the first question I think I can see uh, why we're we using D Portal. I think was the first one. Yes, uh, we use dportal as the data source because at the time, so we, we started doing this in uh, January, February last year, this year, sorry, this year, uh, we couldn't really rely on the data store. Um, uh, just be reminded, take down my, thank you, thank you, take down my screen share, thank you. Uh, we couldn't really rely on, um, on the data store to do this every day, whereas dportal and its queryable backend was really helpful, really useful. And uh, we changed the, um, the query when we saw the COVID uh, sector code come through really you know, overnight. Our colleague Mike in New Zealand did that and the, the next morning the data arrived. So, so for our purposes, dportal, uh, Michelle was, was perfectly fine and, and scalable and robust. Um, thank you. Thank you, Michelle. Um, I've got another question here from Murad, uh, Global Fund. Um, Yes, yes. Uh, so Murad asks, um, related to double counting on financials, did you come up with an algorithm to address this in some way? We did, we did, Murad. Um, we look at the activities and we try and make calculations of the, of the transactions in the activity, which we can then uh, roll up into wider number, into bigger numbers. We didn't look specifically at the, the function of traceability, you know, where, where activities are connected, because that just wasn't there. Uh, you know, there are pockets we know in the, in the in the Dutch data, for example, uh, but we just couldn't rely on that as a mechanism. So in the methodology, which we, we could spend a long time on, we, we had uh, what we thought was a, a, a way to get through this, to not double count, but to use transaction types to understand the, the relative net spending or net commitment of, a, of an activity. And I have one other one from Herman here. Can it be held at the standard that is complicated? Doesn't it just reflect the complexity of development of humanitarian work? Thank you, Herman. Um, that's a good point. I agree. I agree. Um, I think that I think there's some colloquial, if a colloquial complexity around IATI. You know, we really saw that when we were working with this team who were completely new to IATI, and uh, we'd have we'd have a call about IATI, and and then we we'd say, oh yeah, but we we, we meant this instead of this in terms of commitments or transactions. And I think maybe, maybe, maybe to answer your question more clearly, Herman, it's not perhaps the standard itself, but it's the use of the standard that's difficult to explain to people that want to use the data, because we saw so many differing uses of IATI, uh, publishing of IATI data. But I, I think your point is really, really clear and, and stands. It is sta it's a standard. It has to be complicated and complex. But um, and we're not arguing to simplify it. But we should remember in the um, the strategy we talk about simplifying this, the standard as well, Stand, standardizing the standard. Sorry. Okay. I don't know if anyone else wanted to speak uh, too, but I'll carry on with the questions in the in there. And if anyone wants to say anything, that would be really helpful. That would be good. But uh, Tanaka has a point. How do you suggest we strengthen feedback loops, especially for those who may be loan publishers new to IATI? 
yes, um, it's to everybody as well. So maybe someone else could chip in uh, with, with this, but uh, certainly, yeah, the, we, we talked about this around IoT for many years, but how, how do you feedback to USAID, for example, about their data? And that could be many different types of feedback, um, whether it's the validity of the data or the or, 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 or wider issues, for example. Um, I think our our concern was more about how do we how do we feedback to publishers when we're using the data, and that seemed to be quite difficult. Above beyond those that we could talk to directly because we know quite a few people, we didn't know how to reach out to some publishers to to to, to ask them about their publishing practice, and we didn't know how to scale that either. So, uh, yeah. Again, the, the 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 feedback loops could be strengthened, but we, we need we all need to think about that. Has anybody got any more things to say? <laughs> Stephen, if I may, I may come on. Oh, the, thank you, Petra. Uh, yeah, so. <laughs> I can speak to have more voices, but no, thank you very much for the presentation. I think to Tanaka's point on feedback loops, which I think it's really relevant and really good to hear the insights as well from your work. Um, I know that there were some good examples. So of course, sometimes users can identify an email and contact an organizations, but we have a couple of examples where, you know, getting in touch directly with support and us creating that link. So I don't think that's, you know, something that's scalable, but there have been examples where we were able to, you know, reach out and kind of use, you know, be able to be the mediator for those. I know there's probably some people in this group are aware, I know there's kind of a bit of a community effort with something on like bug tracker where some issues were raised and then fed back to some of our organizations. So there are, I think, some mechanisms. I think one of the challenges as well is identifying the most relevant contacts, I think in publisher or I think Tanaka to your point or kind of more, you know, publishers within organizations and identifying the relevant people as well who would have the, um, the answer. Thank you, Petra. Uh, yeah, it is a, is a, it's an ongoing story about feedback and I agree with you. It can be, can be different levels and, and trying to understand where, where it's directed best and acted upon is quite a difficult thing. Um, I saw a couple of hands up. I don't know if Nick or if there are some other people who want to make a comment and I can read the chat and, and, and Think about responses to that as well. Did some people have their hand up? Uh, yes, I did. Uh, would you like me to come in now? Yes, please. Yes, please. Thank okay. you. Hi, I'm Faisa Effendi. I'm with UNDP um, uh, with the Bureau of Program and Policy. Um, I am sorry I saw your presentation and benefited from your from the tail end of your presentation, but I did see your recommendations. And so one that caught uh, my attention was the uh, suggestion of strengthening ART governance. Um, I have put it in the chat box that we all uh, recognize and appreciate that it is multi-layered and fairly distributed. So do you have any specific suggestions about how one might strengthen the governance of ART? to do all that you have mentioned, you know, more on the technical side and for ART to really uh, uh, live up to the expectations of its member states, but also generally of the data community globally. Over. Thank you. Um, that's a really helpful question. Um, I think we, um, so we, I've been through uh, changes to the ART standard over 10 years, many changes to the ART standard and we, we don't seem to have anything planned at the moment. Uh, and I'm not saying we should be changing the standard be just because uh, we don't seem to have anything ready for that. And I think the opportunity now is that there is a real uh, influx of data use. There's some really interesting projects there, including ours, but including others that are, are using IT data systematically and have some very useful feedback to give about their, their usage of the data. And I think the strengthening, strengthening of the already useful governance that we have in place is to try and understand how do we how do we build in those data use that data use feedback directly into the governance, not just to change the standard, but to hear the stories of what the problems are or the challenges are and, and how we can address them. I think maybe we could others may, may want to challenge or add to this, maybe before we change the standard, just because it might be a might have been a might have been a nice idea and we've not really challenged why we need to change the standard. And I would like to hear user evidence for changing the st standard and, and have that discussion before we, before we enter that, I think. And that's just, I think, just a final point there. That's just thinking about the, the standard and the changing of it and the governance. 
there are other wider wider aspects to governance and it's it's also great to see uh, that we have the tool of the working groups and the communities of practice that are beginning to to really uh, embed and hear user stories. So I think more of what we've got and more specificness around what we could have, I think might be my answer, Isa. I don't know if that helps. I think no, you're thank you. That's helpful. Yeah. That's helpful to appreciate that sort of the angle from where you're coming that, you know, somehow the governance mechanism needs to allow sort of these voices to be heard and see what changes can be then rapidly brought about through our work plan or, or other investments that are required. So I hear you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, did we have any other hands up? Um, Nick or Julia, did anybody? I saw some hands go up and I know I, I can't quite see yeah, who's in the room. That was Petra and Visa, so I don't see any other hands up right now. Uh, and I don't see any additional questions in the chat at this time, but Folks, if you'd like to speak, please put your hand up or um, send me a message or just unmute yourself and start talking. I would like to ask people what they, this um, mildly controversial point that I make, that we make about, we're very focused on our own data, not focused on the wider picture. And um, we, we, we've been, we, you know, we, we know that, 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 that there are real efforts to try and coordinate amongst data sets, but I think, I think that there's a real fixation, it seems, on how good is my data. We know we measure each other's data against each other in, in the season trackers. Um, and I would welcome any thoughts from the community about how, how, could, we, how could we turn that into well, how useful is this data in common with others? How, how can we really see the wider trends in the data? not just the, the the specific goodness of one data set and herman thankfully has got his hand up so that's that's good herman to you if, I, if that's if i can see that correctly uh, yes i'd like to comment on that uh, i think the focus on our own data is uh, very much being stimulated by things like the a transparency index the A transparency index measures you as an organization, not on the usability of the data, but of how much and how frequently you publish your data. And uh, I think um, what gets measured gets done. So if we want to change that dynamic, I, sh I think we should far more concentrate on uh, the usability of the data uh, in terms of uh, um, being a part of a network, having and meaning technically getting your references right, you know, getting the references to your funders right, getting the references to which the organization to which you, you give your money right, because then you can look at your place and your contribution in the network of actors within development and humanitarian aid. And that needs a different kind of measuring. And I think that's a key point if you want to change the focus of the publisher to the usefulness of the data for others. Thank you, Herman. That, that's really good to hear. And I know there's a long-standing practice in the Netherlands with the with the MFA to do that. What, when you talk to uh, organisations in your network, is that how you describe the usefulness of IATI? Because I think uh, we mentioned this in the report. We think there's quite a bit of. Um, oftentimes, IATI is seen as a compliance. We're publishing IATI because. Our, our donor exactly. said that we should. And how, how do we get over that hump of, of just doing IATI because anyone else as well is welcome to add to that? <laughs> yeah, I think we you can get over that hump by starting to use the data yourself. Mm. And then you see that you need the data of others in order to get the complete picture. And that will then challenge uh, the quality of your own data, but also the data of, of, of others you want to use. And if you don't have the conversation about each, the quality of each other's publication and actually using the data, uh, not only of yourself, but also of others, that's not going to change anything. I think it's, it's very important that, that we look at ourselves not as an isolated, white tower in nothingness of 
publicating good data and getting their good uh, score on the A transparency index, but that we should think what's our added value of our own data in the network. And that's a different kind of mindset. Thank you, Herman. Yeah, um, thank you. That, that that's really helpful, and that, that's that's towards where we're going with with that about the, about the network of data. And we should remember, not everybody is involved in the A Transparency Index. It's there were thousands, literally thousands, of other publishers who are who are outside of that. But again, it's it's uh, we have to think more widely. I saw two hands go up. Uh, did we have anyone else? Michelle, I think, has got a hand up. Yes. Uh, Hi, everyone. Hi, Michelle. Hi, thank you for this, Stephen. And there's a few things you said in there that I know you and our organization have worked on and hopefully we'll get some, some good information and usable information. When it comes to using more than looking or doing it as more of a compliance, I mean, full and fair disclosure, I, uh, IOM got involved because of the grand bargain and it, was, it really was a compliance thing. And every time we get the um, surveys about data use, it's interesting because I pass it on to other folks within the organization, because while I'm the IoT project manager at IOM, I'm not the user of the data, other than to validate that we've made our data visible and compliant and things like that. Um, I think the use case that you demonstrated just now with COVID is good. I think the conversation um, that USAID, obviously, you know, the use of it and seeing where, IOM is just used to, or our organization, there's people that work in our humanitarian space that have other data sets that they're very familiar with. And getting them to use a new data set when they aren't familiar with the schema, when we don't have technical in-house expertise that can data mine, um, that's why we hire you, Stephen. Uh, it, these are things I think that are the barrier to getting organizations to look at things beyond their own data. Because they, if they don't have the in-house expertise and they don't know what the data can do, it's very hard to get them to see the value. So I don't know if there's possibilities of, um, I, it's, it's not so much, well, I don't know. I, I think that's this, I don't have a solution for it, but it's being able to prove that the IoT data is as valuable, if not more so, than some of the other traditional sets that are out there. And uh, I don't know how to bridge that gap because I'm not even familiar with the traditional ones. Maybe David, who works in the HDX world, you know, kind of knows what all these data sets are and what each can bring to the table and comparing and contrasting what they have is, is an option. But as a non-technical person, I wouldn't even know how to data mine that. So that's the barrier for us to use the data. And it's a long-winded way of saying, I don't really have solutions. I just sort of know why we aren't doing anything with the data other than checking our own compliance. Over. Thanks, Michelle. No, I, I really hear you. Um, th thank you for that. And using each other's data is, is a tricky tricky barrier, we agree. Um, two, two things that we noted in this work, uh, the way that we split transactions up and, and to get smaller figures, we think we have in common with um, uh, Bill uh, Anderson and the team and development initiatives when we talked to the data use working group. So one thing that we, we, one thing that we should align is how we use data together in, in a similar way and make sure we do do that and, and in effect standardize some data use. So that's one thing. And the other thing that was always in our mind with this project is that we should be able to reuse the tools that we're making not for the next pandemic, but for the another theme, another 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 um, output. So we'd be really happy to work alongside others to try and reuse what's made, uh, to look at the data from another lens rather than just COVID, because we might find out a bit more that way. Yeah, so I, I you, think Michelle. that's huge. I think that's huge, Steve. And I think instead of having every single use case a bespoke issue, and being able to know that there's you know, it might not be 100%, but it's the 80-20 rule where you're not starting from scratch is, is huge, particularly, again, for those of us who don't have the in-house technical support and people that know how to grab the APIs and blah, 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 that's out there. Um, that's very helpful. Okay, thank you. Um, so we'd encourage that. Uh, we've got less than 10 minutes. And I know we have to get let people go to the, ne the next room. <laughs> So that's good. So we've got five minutes, I think, or so. Um, Faisal, I saw your hand go up. Yes, thank you. I wanted to speak to your point about uh, compliance. 
And uh, coming from a country office, right? The, um, I must admit that the work burden every year for UNDP country offices, right? To populate the, and update their, um, their IRT portal is considerable. And this is in fact, at least as a senior manager at the country level, I felt that there was a lot of duplication, right? That we had our own systems, right? Where uh, our staff are uploading data and then we had to do it separately for ART. So I think one of the ways for us to overcome the issue and this attitude of that it's a compliance, uh, uh, you know, aspect or the way it's perceived as a compliance, it can be mitigated if we can enhance the ART functionality that it becomes interoperable across different systems. So in fact, it can pick data from you know existing portals that are there for different organizations and then can just you know take it to the to the portal at least the ones that are mandatorily need to be published so i think that can that can be incredibly helpful because both as 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 a member of the art but also as an art user i must say that i have used this data and mined art data extensively and when have i done that and why did i find that extremely useful was, for instance, when they were uh, audit reports, right? And so interestingly, in our organization, I can offer you a little bit of insight about UNDP, that if you go into our own audit uh, system, which we call CARDS, we cannot access the audit reports of other regions or other country offices, which are not in that specific region. But from ART, right? If you go to the ART portal, we can access all that data, even as a UNDP staff member. So I just want to give you a small anecdote. This is just to share a small anecdote about how useful and how important this particular uh, portal is. So just that if we can, I think, enhance that interoperability, that it can actually uh, pick up data from different portals without uh, duplicative data entry, because sometimes you know the staff members are doing nothing else for about one month other than just uploading the ART portal. So I think that would be that could really reduce that work burden and therefore that feeling that we are just, you know, doing it for the sake of compliance. Thank you. Thank you, Pfizer. I think I think that's a really valuable point. Um, we talked of similarly around this about how IATI could become mo modular and interoperable. And by that, I mean, we spent a lot of time in this project extracting out from activities, the transactions, the commitments and the spending. We also know that the, that, that, that data does exist already in financial systems in some cases. So it, it sometimes seems counterintuitive that we've got to get expect the data to come out of systems into IATI and we're, we're then you, reusing that uh, in, a, in a very convoluted way, it would seem. So I, I would welcome a, a conversation, a working group around how we could be more modular and more, more interoperable. Thank you, thank you. I don't know if there are any other questions. I need to look at the, the chat, but if there's anyone to say anything else, We've got a couple minutes, one more minute. Does anybody have any other points? Yeah, I think the most recent message in the chat is the, the most recent question from Anand. Ah, okay, thank you, Anand. Um, about the connection of FTS and IATI. Oh, <laughs> so I worked on that prior to this project, I worked on how could we connect IATI, uh, how could, FTS, a financial tracking service in, in UNOCHA, work with IATI data. And the, 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 in, the consistent inconsistency of IATI data meant it couldn't be done automatically. Uh, it takes lots of curation, lots of work to understand what, what, what bits of IATI are useful to FTS and, and its reporting needs. So the short answer there is there isn't work at the moment being done on connecting the platforms, but I do think a lot of what we've learned here about how we summarize IATI, process IATI, could really help those that want to use at a glance figures and other things. So um, it's a good question. Thank you for bringing me back to that. And, and, and um, yeah, no, I haven't given up. <laughs> Justin, thank you. Is there any other questions or any other points before we move on to our next room? Can I, can I just, uh, my, my comment was a little bit vague, maybe, 
to do with uh, I mentioned that I, I'd really like to see IATA references in, in donor agreements or in pledge letters because it, it speaks to this way that we're just publishing our own data and then looking at our own data and not worrying about everything from anyone else. Like I'd really like to see donors interested in the way that you and age or I work uh, publishing and, and providing us references to help us with that and also be to, to them to say okay we are publishing this way you know and, and having a dialogue that we we, um, we we discuss how we will publish their 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 contributions to us but no one no one is talking about that whatsoever thank you justin be disappointing yeah anyway that's it over <laughs> Thank you, Justin. Yeah, I think I think us having those uh, uh, frank conversations, uh, candid talks, more time would be really helpful. So uh, hopefully we've we've started some of that this afternoon, and uh, look forward to the next couple of days and onwards. I think unless there are any other points, we will uh, we've we've wrapped up everything in this project into a blog on the Center for Humanitarian Data's website. So it's a blog. Uh, summarizing this and then the report that I mentioned and then obviously the links to the data story and the dashboard and um, if there's anything else the other rooms there Nick has just kindly posted them so room one uh, insights on publishers findings from over 100 publishers sorry I think things are... and then room two the uh, moving the gender needle needle okay very interesting so there's two rooms I think there are no, is there something in this room as well and if you stick around in this room, it's uh, data store classic use progress and sustainability coming up um, half past. Enjoy the lobby and the coffee and talking to each other. <laughs> Thank you, Stephen. Thank you. Bye bye. Thanks. Thanks.